Good morning, um, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on what part of the world you are. I just want to warmly welcome every one of you to the Global Dialogue today. Dr. Id Idris Ademuyiwa, he has got a background, he got a PhD in leadership, um, to be precise, organizational management, and he's done quite a lot of studies in terms of being an engineer within the biosystem, and then he's also do, done a BSc in agricultural and environmental engineering. So he's think he's got a wide range of experience, and we'll kind of be discussing with him today and trying to find out more about him. He's currently the CEO and president of the Empowered College of Manitoba um, in Canada, and he's also an adjunct professor as well uh, with the a university in Florida, USA. So we will be having some conversation today and I'm sure that we'll all find this of much value as well. Dr. Idris, please, do you mind telling us, considering emerging lighting technology is, is a very innovative field, how did you find yourself interested in this area? How did you come about this? If you can shed a little bit of light on that, please. Thank you very much. Um, and I'll say good day to everyone as well. And you are enthusiastically welcome uh, to this meeting. And I hope you are going to enjoy yourself. So uh, in terms of uh, lighting and technology, how I try to like get involved in this, um, when I started working you know, in uh, Canada, um, I engaged myself in uh, lighting, uh, testing of uh, LEDs, fluorescent, um, HID, when I mean HID, it means high intensity discharge, right? So, and it consists of a ceramic metal halide, high pressure sodium, and a metal halide lamp. So, I was actively involved in that in the early in the stage of my career. And uh, after a while, we found out at my place of work that uh, people, they don't even understand more about, you know, lighting and there is a need for people to really, you know, get more information about that. So based on my research, I was able to conduct some research and I'm like, wow, this is awesome. We've established this country uh, this company for over 40 something years and we, we don't know anything going on about lighting stuff. So why can't you just start focusing about lighting? So that's why I decided to, you know, um, embrace that aspect. It's not what I actually wanted to do. I wanted to design as an engineer, right? But with passion, and I was able to deliver within a short period of time. So I developed an interest and I'll be asked, you know, to, you know, steer that particular area in terms of lighting, imagine lighting technology in my company. And I've been doing that for over seven years. And, you know, I've discovered a lot of things whereby we go to the USA, different part of the world to present and people are like, wow. So uh, my thinking is, if we don't really understand what is going on in the Western world, what is going on in Africa? So why can't we find a way to impact, you know, our people, like impart knowledge into the medulla oblongata? So that's one of the reasons why I just feel like, you know what, I love this and I have passion for it. Fantastic, fantastic, Dr. Idris. Now, before you get ahead of yourself, uh, because you, you, you used a lot of technical, I don't know, maybe Dr. Adrian as well would also <laughs> bear witness to this, you used a lot of technical um, terms. So if you can please tell us uh, what exactly, because I'm, I'm a novice in this area, what is IT technology? Why okay. is it important? You okay. know, just give us a bit of a background, slow down a bit. I know you're so passionate about it. But... We love that about you, Dr. Idris, that you're uh, so passionate. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> let me just try to lay it more emphasis on this. So lighting technology, you know, is about using the appropriate, you know, lighting in your controlled environment. For example, this focus is going to focus more about plant science research, right? And we are going to focus a bit more about, you know, human stuff, but basically it's about how you can make use of the light in a controlled environment. And why the light itself? Why are we focusing more on light? And that's mm -hmm. the one of the contention here. So if you look at plants in general, they need a light for photosynthesis. And the energy range of what they need is between the 400 nanometers, which is the wavelength, to 700 nanometer. That is what you get outside too, when you just grow some plant out there. So, but it is difficult to grow some plant all year round. Even in Africa, you have a dry season, you have wet season, the temperature varies. But in a controlled environment, 
you can make use of the lighting technology to control and regulate, you know, because the plant requires a certain amount of light. You can't just turn on the light all the time, but there is a need for you to understand about the chemistry and how all this works together, you know, plant, water, you know, CO2, temperature. So you have to make sure that you supply the right, you know, uh, amount of light needed for optimum plant growth. So in my research, in terms of, uh, you know, the wavelength that you need is something that people don't understand. They just decided to uh, put some plant there and, okay, I want to grow. Yeah, I'm having a stunted growth. I'm having this, I'm having this. But if you have a deep knowledge about how those lighting works, it will enable you to be able to say, okay, well, and make a good decision to be able to have, you know, this kind of plant at this particular stage. So in addition to that, in addition to that, it's not only about just lighting that we see because most of us, we can see light, you know, at our various home, we have fluorescent, you have this. But do you know one thing? That some light are even detrimental to our health. So oh. I'm trying to digress from uh, plant science research here. There is something called a spectroradiometer, whereby you can use that to be able to detect, detect the spectrum, right, from the light source. Me looking at it, you may not be able to visualize what is going on there. But by using that spectroradiometer, you can determine the wavelength. And there are some wavelengths that are detrimental to our light, especially UV. It's called ultraviolet UV. And there is a range. So with an extensive research, you can easily determine, you know, all the spectrum and make an informed decision. What kind of light do I need to use? I don't think I have to use this because you have to consider the safety of the people that are also using all these lighting technologies. So most of the, co uh, most of the um, topics that we'll be dealing with in this particular uh, course, it will be focusing more about new emerging lighting technology. What do I need to make use of? Why can't I use this? And it will be focusing more on African settings. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Dr. Idris, for having such great in passion, but concise answers. We really enjoy that. So I want to back up to one of your prior points that you were talking about that you kind of skimmed over, which is talking about differences in lighting in the Western world and in Africa. So focusing on Africa, what are some of the challenges that you see and how does your course give students practical knowledge on really overcoming some of those challenges? Yeah, some of the areas that uh, we need to improve on in Africa is the aspect of research and development. One thing I found out is that uh, most companies, and I'll give you an example. For example, we have International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria. So um, they conduct research, you know, they make use of all these lighting technologies. But even recently, I look at what they are focusing on, their research you will rarely see anything about lighting. And it's because most people, they don't have a deep understanding about how this works. So my own philosophy is how we can impact people over there in Africa. And they can enlighten people in industry, right? Research institutes, universities, right? These are the things going on in the world. Rather than trying to um, buy something from Western world, why can't we develop some things on our own? I could remember in 1970 something, IITA purchased, you know, some controlled environment from the place where I work in Canada. And I found out, you know, there are some they just purchase those stuff. They don't really understand and they look at the specification. But why are they even selecting all those lighting technologies? Because you mm -hmm. have to make a specification. I want this lighting technology. Do you really know whether it is good for your plant? Right, but these people, these people in the Western world, will just recommend something to you, and you make yourself. But we did, you don't have the knowledge about this, and that's why you know most of us we need to find a way to impart those knowledge in the people in Africa on how they can conduct research and help research institutes in Africa. So by doing this, it will not only help creating more jobs for the people, it will also help us to improve on the quality of light we put in our controlled environment, thereby creating a bumper harvest for the teeming population. Even if you can look at it. You know, recently I look at what is going on in South Africa. There's a company called Apex Scientific. They also make use of all this lighting, uh, lighting technology. And that's why I made reference you know, in my own uh, the discourse for with the students. They are going to be focusing on all those stuff related to Africa, not the Western world. But when you don't have the knowledge, how are you going to contribute to the system? So one of the challenges we are having is about the research. People don't have the technical knowledge of, about, about lighting technology. And another issue I see is that our government as well. 
they are not embracing mm -hmm. that. In the olden days, you know, we typically focus more on agriculture. What is going on today? It's a different ball game. But we can re rewrite the history again. But that's why most of us are in the Western world. That's why we have to think of what can we contribute to Africa to make Africa great again. Wow. I mean, you're, you are really sharing a lot of stuff here. And, you know, just touching on what you said and how some of the things that you're introducing to your course. Could you, could you expand on that a little bit and tell us, how have you designed your course to allow the learners to gain practical knowledge? Because that's the emphasis for Siri University. Mm -hmm. The practical aspect of it, not just having knowledge for the sake of it. So could you just shed some light on that, please? Thank you very much for that question. I like that. Um, <clears throat> basically, at the end, the student will be able to measure light intensity. I'll make it simple and I'll explain. Light intensity is sense that I mentioned something about the optimum light requirement for plant. Measuring light intensity entails that you put a sensor, a light sensor under the light source to capture the intensity. When I say intensity, when you go outside, you see sunlight is so bright. What's going on? That means it's intense. Right? It could be like 2,000 micromoles. I mentioned 2,000 micromoles. Micromoles is just a unit, you know, so. And in a human, we could consider foot candles or something, but just to make sure, so you can actually measure that light intensity. And what that one tells you, it will tell you the light requirement that you need for your plant. That is one thing that is missing in most of the companies, not only in Africa, even in the Western world. We have limited number of people that can make use of all this lighting stuff, like measure light scan, understand how to measure and interpret. Because it's not only about measuring, they should be able to analyze as well and interpret and say, well, this is a company, I want this requirement, why do you need this? You need to understand the light requirement first before you purchase anything from anybody. So this student will be able to measure the light intensity in any chamber, also not in any chamber, they can go out there and discover how to measure light intensity from the sun because it has different spectrum, blue, green, red, far red, UV, and each one of them has its own impact on plants, which I can even try to digress more when you ask me more question about that. So the second thing they need to know, understand is about light energy management light energy management you know you can just decide to purchase a light and for example if i'm a manufacturer i can ask you that okay why can't you purchase the controlled environment from me but the question you need to ask is if i use the light emitting diode which is the led or if i use the fluorescent you have to consider the wattage you have to consider the hand draw what is it going to draw because uh, hydro or maybe nepa or anything any kind of uh, you know uh, electrical injection they will charge you every year so you can do your calculation and say, well, this is the actual amount I'm going to spend on lighting for the whole year. So you can conserve energy from that. So students will be able to understand about conservation of energy in terms of lighting. Other things, it's about light spectrum. I mentioned about the color, right? So if you look at that spectrum, uh, because plants thrive well in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. Now. If you are buying a light source, and I can tell you based on my experience, there are some um, lighting, you know, like for example, LEDs, it only has blue and red. If your plant needs far red, and the far red is meant for flowering of plants, and if that light is missing, how are you going to ensure that you have your, you know, the proper growth? So if you don't understand how to conduct a test to determine the spectrum, of all those light sources, it will be difficult for you to know if you're actually getting the right light for your plant. For example, if you look at fluorescent, most of us, we know about fluorescent lighting. <laughs> In terms of fluorescent, fluorescent has a UV, but most of us, we don't know. We have it at various homes. We turn it on, it has a UV, and that UV is in the range of 100 to about 400 nanometers. Some of them, they have UVA, UVB and UVC, 100 to 400 is even categorized, but UVB is not good for our self. Most of them, they are carcinogenic. You may not know, but the point I'm trying to say is that you can only detect all this, by, all this by measuring the spectrum. So the student will have the ability to be able to understand each band, each wave band, what this spectrum means, which one is good for my health, which one is not good for my health. And I will, I will buttress another point on that aspect of spectrum. 
back to you know where I reside here. At my workplace, there are some lighting that you cannot use in any growth chamber. It is not safe. They call it, they are risky. They, they are ranked as risk group three and risk group two. If you expose yourself to those kind of light for a prolonged period of time, it can cause cancer. I can tell you this. So, and I'm in charge of the lighting stuff at my workplace. So I regulate this in charge of control environment uh, and uh, even compliance as well. So all this stuff, they are very crucial, but most people, they don't know. Are you getting my point? So in Africa, what yes. do you expect? We don't have that knowledge. So that's why I've been thinking that, okay, what, how can, what can I give back to these people in Africa? They will learn about that. Another thing they will be able to learn. You can see that they are going to learn a lot in four weeks. Oh my goodness. Yes, so, we're so happy to have you part of a series. Thank you. Okay. Another thing they are going to learn, they are going to learn how to conduct the research. They will be able to review journal papers. Mm -hmm. And when they review about lighting technology, so, and at the end, they will be able to summarize and we are going to have a kind of discussion on how, you know, they will go about it. You know, everything has been laid down in the course syllabus. The most important aspect to me is the last one. They are going to be able to conduct an experiment. And you should ask me a question. How are you going to conduct an experiment? This is about That's what science. I was about to do. Oh so my you goodness. Took the words out of my mouth. Dr. Okay. Idris, how are you going to conduct an experiment as part of your course? <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. So um, if you look at that kind of aspect, I thought about it and I sat down for like several hours before I was able to come with a solution. You know, I had to run like, how, I, how am I going to help these guys? You know, they are not here and I have to do something. So the first thing I did is that they are going to download an app on their phone. This app is called a light uh, meter. Let me see if I can, but I don't know. So it's called a light meter. So the, each student, I want to see if I can show you if you can see something, you know, on my phone. So I have it already. So I have to lead by example. <laughs> so uh, the app, it looks like this. And mm. they can, yeah, so they can, they can actually go through the step-by-step -step approach that I have in the course syllabus. I don't have to be there before they do the research. It's well explained in the course content. So they have to follow the step-by-step -step approach and they are going to um, try to figure out the impact of temperature on fluorescent lighting. I've done the research before. I know the outcome. I know what they are going to get, but I want them to understand what is going on. And most people, they don't understand. And I will give you an example about that. When I ITA purchased a plant growth chamber from um, where, the place where I work right now. They purchased a kind of a lighting, which is fluorescent lighting. But at that period, they didn't understand that when the temperature reduces, when you try to lower the temperature, your intensity is going to reduce. Mm. It's going to affect your intensity. And not only by affecting, it could be up to 50%, depending on the temperature range. I don't want to disclose that here because if I disclose that and the student, they are able to know what I'm talking about, then there is no <laughs> point in doing research again. So I've asked them to conduct some kind of research. They will get a fluorescent lamp it can, in, at their various home or they can go to their friend's home download the app, get an ice block, place it very close to the uh, fluorescent lamp, try to use your phone to measure the intensity. Although they won't be able to get it in a micromoles per meter square per second, what we use in, uh, uh, in a plant science research, but they'll be able to get it in foot candles, right? Um, yeah, they will be able to get in the full candle and we can do the conversion. There is a conversion which I'm going to provide to them. So they will be able to understand how to conduct that research and they are going to write a report. So they are going to know how to even write a comprehensive report at the end of that, which I call like practical. Wow. I mean, um, he is, I'm kind of very eager now to jump in on your course and, and you know, learn a lot about it. But there's a lot of technicalities to all the things that you've explained. And yep. considering the context, how would the student be able to, to do all of this? Because, you know, the infrastructure is not there. I mean, you know, how do you want them to achieve this in your course? Okay. Thank you very much for that question as well. Um, uh, the first thing is uh, in my own uh, course that I designed, uh, the student will have an access to the videos. So they are just going to click, there's a link. I make it simple for them. Just click on it at your own leisure time. They can actually you know, view those videos and digest and understand. They will come and uh, 
try to explain what they've learned in the discussion forum and we can try to relate with one another. Another point is this, apart from the video, I have some journals that they can review, simple journal. And if they don't understand, I also, I'm also planning to have a Zoom meeting. Oh. I know this may go beyond what is necessary, but my own philosophy is to impart the knowledge, not just to yes. try to develop a course. My goal is at the end, they will say, yes, I can stand and I can compete with all the experts in the lighting technologies. So I plan to have a Zoom meeting every Saturday right? You can write it down. Anybody that is interested can also join. So, and I'm going to record. I will try my best to record and post it for them. So they can also listen and watch at their own leisure time, just for them to understand more about lighting, you know, technology. I will make things simple for them. So by seeing the way things have been done and reading that, you know, in their journal and some other, it will make life more easy for them. So they can actually relate what they are learning in the material with what I'm sharing to them in real life. Right, so I want to make sure I try to blend theory with practice in this, so that life will be more meaningful to them, and they can actually say, "I can do this, I can do that." And at the end, I believe they will be glad for taking this course. Okay, now I just want to ask a follow-up question. Sure. Because considering the fact that the institutional framework, the systems in Africa, now these students have done the course and they want to, you know, go ahead. They want to implement some of the things that you've taught them. Now, how successful would this be, considering the fact that, you know, some people don't even understand this, the government, there's nothing in place, you know, to help support this sort of technology. How do you think they can navigate this challenge or to get people interested in this or to people to understand this? I mean, even other stakeholders, like even laymen in the country, understanding the impact of lighting and, you know, technology around it. Yes, thank you very much for this. You know, if you look at the course material, I mentioned about how to conduct a research and they are going to know how to write, you know, more about proposal. So we can go to all those uh, government patterns that don't want to embrace and don't want to develop, you know, write a proposal, let them understand what is going on. By the time people see something, you know, like people don't argue with results, right? So by the time they see what is happening around the world and how they can make use of that to develop our nation, then, I believe they are going to embrace that. And to be honest with you, what I want to do for this student is to work with them, even not only after and you know, during the pro uh, program, I want to work with them after the course. If they need a I will be, I will support them. I will be like a mentor for them. When mm -hmm. they need, you know, because I, I know what it takes to learn all this. It's not easy. If you are trying to listen to me just in a day, like, oh, what is this guy talking about? Right. I know it took me years to understand everything <laughs> I'm trying to share with you in 30 minutes. So the point I'm trying to make is after learning all this stuff, I know they may not know some stuff on how to navigate through, but I can, st I can tell you that they have somebody, you know, that will serve as a mentor for them to even assist them so that they can actually thrive well, not only in Africa, but I want people in the Western world to be coming to Africa to even embrace what we are doing. Right. Ah. So that's my own take on that. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Dr. Idris, I wanted to go back and piggyback on something you were talking about before, which is talking about imagining different things about barriers that African countries might have to embracing this new or better or more knowledge about lighting technology. So you mentioned the government, you talked about some barriers there, but you also mentioned some about specification, almost as if, I know you're in Canada, maybe the, can, the Canadians have certain specifications on lighting, and when you give it to somebody else here, they're in Africa, they're just following what they have written down without understanding um, what needs to be done. So how do you plan on addressing that either in this course or maybe a subsequent course that you might create for yourself and your students? Thank you very much. Um, at present, you know, uh, I'm creating an algorithm right now uh, mm -hmm. as part of the research I'm doing. So um, that algorithm will enable anywhere, anybody in the world, not only in Western world, so it is applicable. So it's going to be like a generalized concept where people can apply and make use of it. Right, so you can easily make use of that to select an appropriate, you know, lighting technology that you need. For example, if you need 500 micromoles, 
you need a lot of information, right? Um, I, I won't go into details. Those are technical aspects of it. <laughs> Before you crucify me for that, so <laughs> so the, the the aspect is a lot of things must have done gone like I must have done some stuff in the background and incorporate that into that. So the only thing they have to do just press and it will tell you what you need, right? So it's like I'm doing all the work and I'm making life easy for those guys out there. So those are some of the things in in terms of specification because they have the list. You know, people mm -hmm. tell you know, okay, purchase it, purchase that, purchase this. But you know, when you look at this, all this stuff and you don't even know how to check all those specifications. There's something right. they call verification, validation, right? So functionality, performance. So, but in my own case, they can verify what is in the specification. By the time you verify that, even by just telling you, in this room, I need 10 lamps to be able to get 500 micromoles. How are you sure? Because if you don't have the knowledge, I can tell you, hey, doctor, why can't you use 15 lamps? You don't have the knowledge you purchase, you spend more money. But when you understand about the spec and I give you the algorithm, check what they are selling to you. It makes life more easy for you to be able to say, yeah, I don't think I need this. I don't think I need that. Those are some of the things that uh, we've encountered even here in the Western world. And I said, yeah, it has to stop. How can we just be spending a lot of money, you know, out there because we don't have the un understanding and knowledge about it. So by helping people to understand how to relate the specification to the database that we are planning to create an algorithm, it will enable them to be able to make an informed decision, right? Rather than depending on what people are going to offer them. Fantastic. Now, let me just ask, um, what is light planning? I know that's oh. something that comes up in your field and I'm very interested to know what this concept means. Yeah, me too. I like your question. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so light planning, um, Presently, it's a form of um, way to say, for, well, this is the type of uh, um, lighting requirements that I need for my plant. For example, if you want to grow maybe um, up or maybe like you want to grow lettuce and you're telling me, oh, I want uh, 500 micromoles, right? And I have to think about it. What is the size of your room? Is it 12 by 12 inches or four foot by four foot? So there are some calculations that will go into that, that will enable you to plan to ensure that you are getting the actual, you know, light that your plant needs, you know, to thrive well for photosynthesis. And, you know, because you have to think about not only the light, because if you have a lot of too much light, it's going to affect the temperature. So all those things, they are interrelated. So with my light plan, it will tell you, I need this number of lamps, I need this number of micromoles, right? I don't need this, I need that. So by using that word, it helps you to be able to, you know, put all those in context and make sure that you're not spending a lot of money. Because if you don't plan, we typically know that if you don't plan very well, eh, what is going to happen? You may likely fail. So when you're able to plan the kind of light requirement that you need, it will enable you to know that you are not going to have more impact on the uh, plant itself. Because if, you, if your plant needs 500 micromoles and you are supplying 1,000 micromoles, what is going to happen, the plant may die. So you have to make sure you plan ahead of time. But it entails a lot of calculations. You have to think about, you know, um, do I even have to install, how many number of LEDs do I need? Because when you think about the number of lighting that you need, you have to think about installation. There are a lot of things <laughs> that are involved in that. So it can even take, you know, weeks to put all those kind of life plan together. And currently, I can tell you, in for that life plan, some people, they've already developed a software right now. So with that software, they can enable you to be able to determine um, the lighting requirement that you need in terms of intensity. So what I'm doing right now on my home, um, it's, it's going to be similar to that. But my home, it could be like just a kind of a spreadsheet or something to make life easy for my student press this, it tells you this, right? But if they want to go deeper into the calculation, that's going to be another different cause. It's beyond the scope of this cause. No, I just, I just want to follow up on that question. Now, how easy is it to do lights in, light planning in Africa? Or are there, are there organizations um, implementing this currently? Are there some best practice examples that you could share with us? Maybe indigenous yeah. um, firms or even foreign firms within Africa e exploiting this? Yeah. So when, when I look at uh, this uh, Agnetics uh, solution, like they are in uh, South Africa, 
-hmm. they make use they design a controlled environment it's part of what i have in the course content like if agnetics asks you to design this you know just in form of a, a what problem right ask you to design this and they are going to relate it to the material so what kind of light requirement that you need so that's when the aspect of light planning comes in but i'm just going to introduce them to the concept a bit not to the design aspect of the light planning so some of them, those ones that, that one is in south africa they are currently you know making use of this kind of uh, you know light planning but the point is this some of them they just ask all those guys from the western world please can i just get your kind of light plan we can create something in africa right yeah. so that is the point i'm trying to make here so they still make use of some but it's not something that they developed on their home but personally for me i like to create things right so and when you create something i derive joy in that i derive passion in that so that's why i say we can rewrite the history rather than just following what uh, some kind of app that they've designed for you and they just tell you use this i will tell you one thing here i discovered something recently uh, we decided to ask some companies uh, to do the light planning for us. And they ask us to use about 112 LEDs. Very expensive. Maybe it's going to mm. cost around 50 something thousand Canadian dollar. At the end, we found out that we, 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 we were not supposed to even use up to 100 lighting. After I did some calculations, right? Because initially I was not in that, uh, you know, final area. I was not even trying to deal with them in terms of who is going to make use of that. We just tried to outsource that. And I said one day, I said, no, this has to stop. Let's do some calculation here. So those are some of the things I want us to like encourage people in Africa, you know, research institutes, you know, they can start doing something on their own. And it has to start from these students. If they're not ready, some people will drive them to start doing that. But we can only do that by showing them the result. And I believe they are going to embrace that with time. Wow, fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Idris. There's so much to digest here. Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Adrian. Oh, thank you. Yes, I am having fun talking to you, Dr. Idris. Here. Thinking about that, I can see growth not only in your students of having very practical knowledge and using apps and algorithms to figure out different light planning, but it seems like as you grow that you're willing to also mentor your students. So how is your interest in growth facilitating that of your students or what would be your former students? Because we want them to graduate, move on, take more courses. Hmm. So um, after they graduate you know, from this uh, particular course, um, you know, what I'm planning to do is I'm going to just give them my contact. It's going to be open to them if they mm -hmm. need. Right. Some of them, they may want to be independent on their home. Maybe they are, they are, you know, they've learned a lot and they feel they are independent on their home. Right. They can decide. But if they decide to like, I want to learn more from you because there is more to learn. Correct. It's just four weeks. Right. There is more <laughs> to learn. <laughs> and, you know, I'll be willing to give them, you know, free you know, resources and they'll be able to improve. You know, let me tell you one thing. I'm still learning. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So if they are telling me that they are done, I don't think so. So as far as I'm still learning, they stood their self to continue to learn. <laughs> so that's the way I see that. Okay, great, thank you. Everybody's in a continuous learning cycle. Yeah. Great, excellent. Thank you for your mentorship. Dr. Amarachi. Yeah, the day you stop learning, you stop leaving. Exactly. Now, I just mm. want to ask another question. These, are, these questions are on the chat. It says, someone is asking you, Indy Emmanuel says, is there a way to handle the problem of irregular electricity supply in many African countries? Ah. Yeah, that, that's, that's a very good uh, question, you know, it's, and it's one of the challenges I've been thinking about, that how are we going to overcome that? I know that most people, they are using solar, you know, but in terms of cost, that, that is going to really help in terms of solar because all year round, you don't have snow on like what is happening in the Western world, right? If you're able to install that at your facility, and that's going to be just, you know, once, you know, in a, in a, for some time, you know, it can last for some certain period of time. So by making use of that, it will help. That is one aspect of it. It is very challenging when you are using a generator, you know, to power <laughs> all your, you know, machines and some other stuff. And that is one of the things that electricity is crucial in africa if that is the only thing the government can solve oh my goodness we can turn the world you know <laughs> into another thing so it's, it's a major challenge but the only thing i see is that people just have to find an alternative source 
of power supply that will enable them to reduce the cost. And another thing is this, when you even try to purchase, one thing I've realized is even if you use all those kind of uh, generator and some other stuff, and you select an appropriate lighting solution, it reduces your cost in terms of consumption, and it will uh, enable you to be able to, you know, um, have a kind of a bumper harvest within a short period of time. But in a, in, a, in a general sense, electricity is a major challenge that we are facing in Africa, and it has to be addressed. Great, we have another question from our audience. We love questions, so guys, please give us more. And this participant, Emmanuel, wants to know, is lighting technology research focused to be useful for greenhouses and enclosed room situations? So very practical question. Yeah. Dr. Idris. Yeah, it is, it is possible. Um, if you look at what is happening, even at my workplace, we have a, um, a greenhouse and we also have a controlled environment, just like two things at a time. Now, it is applicable because it now depends on the kind of environment. Even if you look at Africa, because my focus is going to be on Africa, during the dry season, you know that the temperature drops, you know, maybe it can drop to like 12 degrees C. And you have a plant, right, that can actually try maybe in 20 degrees C to 25 degrees C. What do you have to do? How do you control your environment? So in terms of lighting, you have to make sure you regulate because I can tell you there is a relationship between temperature and lighting. So you have to make sure that you strike a balance between the two. That's when the aspect of this lighting technology comes in. When you have the instrumentation to check what is coming out from your light source, right? And you look at what is happening in the, you know, in the greenhouse itself, because it's been exposed and you can still have some kind of sunlight from outside source. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure you strike a balance. In a controlled environment, it's a different broad game. So there won't be more impact, any impact from the outside. So because you are just control, it's an enclosed chamber whereby you don't have any form of external factors unless you open the fresh air at the exhaust. You may decide not to open that because it depends on the kind of experiment you are conducting. So if it's a controlled environment, so external influence will not have a major impact unless you have a kind of a, you know, open vent. And even if you have it in an open, if you have an open vent open, what we recommend to most people is that anywhere you put all this controlled environment, like a plant growth chambers, you can regulate at 21 degrees and 50%. So when you put those chambers under environmental condition, if you open the vent, it doesn't make any impact because your surrounding environment is still maintaining 21 degrees to 50% that will enable your plant to thrive well. But in a greenhouse, it is a different ball game. So you have to make sure that, you know, you control some stuff, make sure that you balance your light, you know, CO2 emission and some other stuff. So there's a slight difference, but you just have to understand what kind of lighting, like where I work right now, we currently use a high intensity discharge. Some of what them is that? Uh -huh, thank you for that. So, <laughs> so high intensity discharge is called, um, we have a three of them. One is ceramic metal halide. So, and the other one is high pressure sodium. High pressure sodium, you know, in your car, some of, some of us, when you buy some cars, they use that kind of lighting too. So it's not only about plant science, and we also have a, a metal halide. So what that one does, I mentioned about that. So metal halide, and HPS, some of them, they have UV. So some of them, they have a UV, and which means that if you are not careful, if you expose yourself to those kind of lighting for a prolonged period of time, it, can, it is detrimental to our health. It can cause serious havoc. So for me right now, if somebody comes to me and asks me, oh, I want to purchase this, I would recommend don't purchase HPS and M8 for now, but you can purchase C image. Then how do I know? Those are the questions. Me looking at it, you can never differentiate between them. But you can only discover all this by testing them, you know, with a light meter. And that is one basic thing that these guys they are going to learn. And I will tell you one thing here. In the Western world here, yeah, there are some professors. The only thing they focus more is just on lighting. And they are getting a lot of money. And I look at their research recently, I was like, oh my goodness. This guy has been working on this for 25 years. In Africa, we are not, um, we are not, I can say that we are not developing, but we have to develop at all means, by all means. So that's the way I see that, how can we, you know, try to improve on all this stuff as well. 
Excellent. Very exciting. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Great. Now, I just want to ask you um, another question. Now, considering that we've talked a lot about lighting technology, now how can we leverage on this technology to grow crops that are not originally from Africa? So crops that you cannot get grown or in Africa. How can you leverage on this to achieve that, please? Thank you very much for your question. You know, when I mention about controlled environment, that is the whole essence. That is the major difference between what is happening outside and what is happening in the controlled environment. Controlled environment simply means that you can grow any form of, you know, a plant all year round without having, you know, to think about in terms of temperature or humidity. So when you have that, that's why there is a difference between that with a greenhouse, because you still have to, you know, it's open to the sun, sunlight can still penetrate through. But this controlled environment, there are a lot of things going on there. You can go, for example, we sell some of the units, it can go up to zero degrees, it can go up to minus 20 degrees C. Wow. So that, yes, minus 20 to plus 45, even at times plus 50 degrees C. All the plants, they are in that range. So any form of kind of research you want to do, I give you that unit, you do it. <laughs> so even during the dry season or maybe rainy season, you can still do anything without having any impact on what you are doing. So that is just about control environment. It's a very, um, I can tell you that uh, though it is expensive, recently I had a conversation with somebody from Africa, especially in Nigeria, and this man is rich and he said, I would like to purchase this. There are a lot of opportunities in Africa, but we have not been able to tap into those ones. And he said to me that he's trying to collaborate with some people so that they can purchase all this stuff and grow some scrub that cannot be even, that we typically import from, you know, Western world. Then why do we have to be, still be doing that in the 21st century? It's because most of our government, you know, parastata, they are not embracing all this stuff. So what I'm trying to say in essence is that if you're able to get this controlled environment in Africa, we can, you know, we don't have to be importing any kind of uh, food stuff, you know, from maybe a Western world. We can just simply put some stuff in the unit, but you need to have an understanding. And that's where all these guys that are going to graduate from this course, that's where they come into play and say, yes, you are purchasing this. I can help you out, right? But if you don't have the knowledge and you purchase nobody to maintain it for you, there is a problem. You don't know how to even resolve the issue. Then it's like wasting your time. So these guys that are going to graduate from this particular course, they will be able to you know, help people out there. That's why I mentioned about writing a proposal and let people understand why they have to do it. Because when people don't see the value in what you are doing, they can never embrace it. But you have to show it to them with results. People will never argue with that. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, this kind of follows up with a question on the Q&A, so I just have to ask that alongside. Someone is asking, he says, do you see an opportunity for people to start a consulting firm using this knowledge on lighting technology? If so, how do you suggest that they approach it? Yes, I, I see that um, there's an opportunity, but the first thing is they need to acquire more knowledge on that. If you want to be a consulting firm and uh, you don't have you know, the adequate you know, information to supply people, people just contact you and they ask you some questions. Um, it's just like, you know, you have nothing to offer. So the first thing is there is an opportunity in that area. Number two, before people can be a consultant, you need a, you know, and you need to acquire more experience, right? And it's a matter of time. It's not about something you can just acquire one day you read. It's about trying to understand and do some kind of research as well. And I will give you an example. I just discovered something recently because I'm also in charge of research and development at my workplace, right? So we are trying to work on trying to optimize, you know, cost optimization of some of the existing plant growth chambers, whereby we want to look at it. Oh, do we really need this part, you know, in this chamber? Uh, this chamber can still function well. So I want to reduce some of the cost by 18%, some by 16%. So I have all those stuff going on with me apart from lighting stuff. So the bottom line, you know, in, in that aspect is this. When you look at that aspect, you look at, okay, I can, I don't think we need this. I don't think we need that. If you're able to resolve that aspect, then you now be thinking, okay, what kind of uh, opportunity that people need about this lighting stuff? So one of the things I figure out is about the um, uh, far red LED. The far red LED, if you look at uh, most uh, literatures right now, people will tell you that 
it only contributes about 10% of the total lighting. And I found out recently that it is not true in some cases. There are some LEDs that you select that you get more than 10%. So people ignore that aspect of intensity that comes from the far red. So as a consultant, and they come to you and you say, okay, it's just 10%. Then you are giving them wrong information. So that's why I mentioned that when people acquire more knowledge, they will be able to give people, you know, a, a lasting solution to their predicament. So that's the point I'm trying to make here, you know, research, get more knowledge. When you get more knowledge, then you can be a consultant, but I see a lot of opportunity in this. Even there are some consultants here, you know, and those guys, they are making a lot of money. I'll tell you, one guy retired from my workplace, he's still a consultant now. Wow. Because of the experience he has acquired. When I started with the company, you know, he was in charge of, you know, doing some kind of lighting. But I focus more on it, you know, testing, validation, you know, and people are like, yeah, this is the result. It's not based on theory. You have to blend, you know, theory with practice. And if you combine the two and you present that, people are like, oh, they can't, they will just say, okay, yeah, this is good. This is good. This is good. To be honest with you, I will tell you one thing. <laughs> when I started working at my work, at my workplace, um, they told me one, one thing, like, we need somebody that can help us, you know, improve about the lighting stuff. There was no one then. And I said, well, this is a challenge for me. I solved a lot of you know, complex problems. So, but even when I started there, there was no black guy, you know, in the office area, I can tell you. So the only guy that started working there, like as a black guy, like show floor and at the end, like somebody will ask me one day, how did you get in here? I'm just telling you the truth. How did you get it? But with time, you know, they saw something like, oh, there is something in this guy. And I'm just happy you know, to be in that environment because I'm contributing my own quota. And it is time for me to help people in Africa. Wow. Wow. I mean, that, that was some motivational moment right there. Thank you. For doing <laughs> yeah. that. Um, it's always good to distinguish yourself, irrespective of what you do. Just stand out. Do it yeah. with dignity and do it to the best. And, you know, your situation can attest to that. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Idris. Dr. Yeah. Adrian. Wonderful. Well, I always love that you have a heart for Africa and I being, you know, a business minded lady also see a lot of opportunities with people who can be consultants in the anywhere in Africa, because I think there's a lot of opportunities because I don't think this lighting and lighting planning is well understood quite yet from people who do and don't have money. Moving back to one of our questions that our audience is wondering about today. Um, I also study health, so I was wondering this myself. So it might seem a little elementary to you, Dr. Idris, but stick with us. And the question is, are, X, are UV rays from X rays detrimental to your health or not? And is there an alternative to X rays? And I know that you were mentioning um, different type of bubs that are also detrimental to your health. Being a lay people, not in your field, we don't know what's detrimental to our health. Can you inform us about that? Okay. Thank you very much for that question. Um, when I mentioned about the UV light, you know, UVB is basically the one yes. that is, you know, detrimental to our health. And if you look at the wavelength of that, it's in the range of around two something to 315, like 210 to 350, 200 to 315. So to be honest with you, that spectrum is not visible to our naked eye. You can see it. You can see it. I have to be honest with you. But the only way to figure that one out by using either a spectroradiometer, which is a light meter, right? And then um, in addition to that, that's why you know, I mentioned about the app on my phone, an app on my phone. I'm looking for an app right now that can, or if I can develop that, you know, it's just a matter of time, whereby people can just, you know, sit down right in their home and just put it right close to the light source and they can capture the UV range. Actually, this app can actually do some of those stuff, but I have to test because I don't tell people what I have not done, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm very sure, it now depends on the wavelength that they have in this particular app 
I have on my phone. So if that wavelength can cover the range of 100 nanometers to around 800 nanometers, people should be able to use their phone to detect, you know, what kind of uh, spectrum is detrimental to their health. But the range, I can tell you the range is below that 400 nanometers. So when people use the app on their phone or they have a different ways, you know, maybe cheap solution to just capture, you know, the wavelength, and they will be able to say, yeah, I don't want to buy this type of, uh, you know, light source. But the, cha the challenge is this. If you don't turn mm -hmm. it on, how will you know? So Correct. if you have already purchased that, <laughs> but one thing is this, I can tell you this. This is very good. Before they purchase any kind of a lighting, you know, uh, source or LED fixture, <clears throat> one thing they should be asking for is the light spectrum. Mm -hmm. Or it's called spectra power distribution. If people can ask for that, then people will like, oh, it's like you know about this lighting stuff. So if they see the range of 100 to 400, they should decide not to buy like for their own you know, application. Some of them are good for plants. You know, mm -hmm. let me be clear mm -hmm. on this. Some mm -hmm. of them are good for plants, but I'm talking about human being, right? And it's not that maybe it's detrimental if you just expose them within two minutes, three minutes, it's fine. But okay. for a prolonged period of time, right and that is one thing i'm trying to point out here that if you're able to have that kind of a opportunity to take measurement of that or discover that okay this is the range of what is not good for me so that 100 to 400 is something that we need to look into if possible <clears throat> and i will tell you if you look at the from 400 to 500 that one is very good it's blue light uh -huh. what, yeah blue light blue and red they are very good for plants so 500 to 600 is, is considered as green light. And each one of them, it has its own meaning, you know? So if you look at the green, it helps for the, you know, physical, you know, architecture of the plant. And the red is, it optimizes the plant growth, it's good. So even if you see any kind of light source that has blue and red, most of the plant can thrive well. But there are some of them, if they want to like for flowering of plant, you need the far red. And the far red is in the range of 700 to 800. Okay. People, cat people categorize them at times to the range of 702 nanometers to 761 nanometers. So, which means you have a kind of a plant that needs, you know, to flower and it just supply LED. Yeah, I just purchased one LED and it has only blue and red. And like, what is going on here? It's not, you know, driving the way I want, but you don't understand the spectrum. So, in, I will tell you this, in most of our units, uh, we supply a uh, plant growth chamber that has both far red, we call it a balanced spectrum, whereby you have all the combination. You have a blue, you have a red, you have a green, you have a far red. So if a researcher wants to conduct an experiment, they can actually turn off some and still leave some on, depending on what you want to do. But if you don't have deep understanding, you just leave all the lights on and like mm -hmm. you cost. The, the plant will be confused at times too, right? Yeah, I don't need this. So... If you look at what people are doing right now, they are trying to mimic, you know, the actual environmental condition outside. <clears throat> For example, early in the morning, maybe they can just run a chamber at a maybe maybe 18 degrees C, maybe around 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. They will be running 25, depending on the temperature outside. Let me tell you one thing. There is something called light DNA, whereby I can mimic, mm -hmm. I can mimic the environmental condition in any part of the world. That is not designed by us, but we purchase and we are using in some of our units. Whereby I can be in Manitoba here in, in Canada and say, yes, in Africa, I want to mimic the environmental condition in Africa. So what I just have to do with the controlled environment, you just press some buttons and you will mimic that kind of uh, environment in Africa at that period. It's a high tech LED, right? Wow. So a lot of things are happening. People can do a lot of research, but it now depends on the depth of your knowledge, you know, in doing that kind of a research. So anything is possible, you know, with a controlled environment, it now depends on the cost. How much do I have to conduct some research? To be honest with you, I could remember when I was doing my undergraduate in Nigeria, um, I designed, that's why I say I like innovation. Yeah. I, <laughs> I designed an incubator, right? That can actually hatch, you know, day old chicks, and in that particular incubator, you have the temperature, you have the light. You can see, I've been doing this for a while too, so I don't even know why. <laughs> so in that particular one, I used uh, just an incandescent bulb. An incandescent bulb is being replaced by far red because, because of the color Kelvin. Oh, that's another time I'm introducing, and I know maybe we may extend beyond this. 
<laughs> but let's just leave it as it is, you know. But to be honest with you, one of the things that students are going to learn is about the color Kelvin, because uh, the color of the uh, each lamp. There are some. If you look at the normal incandescence, it ranges from around two thousand seven hundred to three thousand Kelvin. So when you see that, you know this is incandescent bulb. When you see the cool white, it could be like fluorescent, right? Depending on the spectral range. So there are a lot of things to learn about. But I hope the student at the end of the program, they will say, yes, I, I know some stuff that I can go, go out there and impact knowledge into the people. Wow, wow, fantastic. I mean, I, I just, I feel like just enrolling on the course right now and straight away started it because we feel really challenged. Uh, but one question to ask, because you kept referring to the app, the app, the app, is it free? It's free. Yay! No, it's free. It's free. They don't have to pay anything. So one of the things I, when I started to design the course, I looked at it and said, how can I make life easy for the people? Because I know even the internet is not easy, to be honest with you, when I was in no. Nigeria, <laughs> when I was doing my undergrad, I did not even have a laptop. So I understand, I was just like thinking about all these guys, like, how are they going to cope? Even to watch video, if they want to use the data on their phone and some other stuff. So I can feel for them. You know, it's not, it's not that easy. So the app is free. They just have to download it. And, um, you know, everything is, you know, well informed. Like they can easily just press the app and download and they can start doing what they, what they want to do. But in What's the syllabus. Name, the name of the app. Please. Yes, how can we get the app? I will yeah. send it. It's light meter. It's light meter. Light meter. Light meter. Okay. And even when you download it, it's free. So you see free there. It's free. <laughs> thank you to my co host, uh, Dr. Muga. And thank you for our honored guest here, Dr. Idris Adelakam, if I pronounce that correctly, for helping us out. This was very exciting. Thank you for talking about a practical aspect of your course and the app. And we will definitely enjoy your courses and you for many years to come. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, audience. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.